Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our August uh, edition of the Kidney Project YouTube Live. Um, today our theme is patient preferences and, um, and how the artificial kidney reflects um, patient preferences. But before we start the main part of today's session, um, I have some breaking news. I'm going to share my screen and um, we have uh, a new Kidney Project merchandise store. So you are now able to buy some Kidney Project swag or buy gifts for your loved ones. Um, see it right here. Uh, the address is the kidneyproject.store. And so you can um, pick up something like a hat, a mug, a tote bag, um, international shipping is available. We've tested everything for quality. Um, and uh, all the proceeds will go to benefit the project. Um, and we hope that this is a way to also help um, spread awareness of our, our work. So um, check it out. And we'll be announcing it on our social media tomorrow, I think, and um, share it with your friends and loved ones. Um, and um, with us today for our, our YouTube is patient advocate, Precious McCowan. Um, Precious is a member of our patient advisory council at the Kidney Project and is a two-time kidney transplant recipient. Um, and she's a member of many local and national um, kidney patient organizations. Uh, she was recently interviewed for NPR's All Things Considered um, for a story on the United, Net United Network for Organ Sharing. Um, and I'll put the link in the chat. It's really interesting and I encourage you to check it out. Um, and many of you will also know Dr. William Fissell. Um, he's our Kidney Project um, Medical Director and one of the co-inventors of the implantable artificial kidney. Um, and he is a practicing nephrologist on the faculty at Vanderbilt um, University Medical Center. So um, thanks for joining and I'll hand things over to uh, Dr. Fissell to get us started. Hi, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you, Liz. Um, it's Absolutely fantastic. I think that today we'll be talking about patient preferences. I come to my job as a physician, as a doctor, with maybe a slightly different uh, load of baggage than some other people do. Um, first, many of you who have who've participated in our, our live stream chats before know that I was uh, discharged out of the hospital when I was two and a half years old. Uh, the time prior to that was spent uh, working on plumbing in me. So I have a fair number of years of experience uh, on the patient side of the desk instead of the physician side of the desk. Long before I ever went to medical school, uh, I was uh, a consumer of medical care for my kidneys. And in the 1980s and the early 1990s, I was an emergency medical technician and paramedic in the Boston area. And one of the things that we did when we were not answering 911 calls was transport patients from their homes to the dialysis clinic. This would be uh, the kidney center on Commonwealth Avenue and, and bring them back again. And so, you know, Boston traffic being what it was, I spent an awful lot of time uh, in the ambulance with my patients. And I got a fairly good earful about how they felt about the burdensome things they had to go through to stay alive. And so as a patient, and then as somebody whose experience in healthcare originated not at the top of the ladder as a physician, but instead near the bottom of the ladder as an ambulance driver, um, I might have a little different finger on the pulse of, of what patients need and want. 
Um, I've joked often in the past that when we talk about patient preferences, um, most patients with kidney disease would prefer to not have kidney disease. And that's the way the challenge should be framed. Um, they really just don't want any of this. They didn't ask for any of this. They didn't order any of this. And they would just as soon have it all go away again. Um, and so with that background, I'm excited to have Precious McGowan here with me today to talk about how patients' preferences in the specific sense of the word, not in the, gosh, I'd really rather not have kidney disease, but in the specific sense of the word in understanding the trade-offs that have to be made with technologies that patients will use, that these technologies are developed to reflect what the patient wants out of their daily life, rather than simply what the physician wants in terms of a lab value or the Food and Drug Administration wants in terms of some profile or another. The Kidney Project starts and ends with what patients want and with what patients need. And that's informed how we've designed and we're developing the technologies we have. And it's been absolutely wonderful to get to know Precious as a member of our patient advisory council. And, um, you know, my patients are my heroes. They, every one of them has a courage and a positive attitude that really is the emotional fuel for the cognitive engine that keeps me going in working to find a better solution for patients with kidney disease. And so before we get into the, the question and answer session, I'd like to have Precious join us now and tell us about her history. Absolutely, thank you so much, Dr. Fassell. Hi everyone, my name is Precious McCowan. And um, in 2010, I was diagnosed with end-stage uh, kidney disease. I did in-center hemodialysis for exactly four months. And then I received both a kidney and pancreas transplant. Unfortunately, both organs only survived for seven months. So, you know, I was absolutely devastated when I learned that I would have to return back to in-center hemodialysis and wait an additional nine years doing dialysis before I received my second kidney transplant in 2019. You know, during that time that, that um, before I went into kidney transplant rejection, four days before that, my um, two-year-old son had passed away unexpectedly. And I share his story because his, his passing is, is bittersweet. Bitter because that was my only son. That was the love of my life. I loved him dearly and his death was unexpected. Sweet because my husband and I decided to donate his organs to be a blessing to someone else so that they can have a second chance at life. So having to deal with the passing of my son, then four days later, dealing with rejection of both a kidney and pancreas transplant was a lot on me. So when I returned to in-center hemodialysis, I was not an uh, activated patient. I was not involved with my health care. Um, I did not receive effective emotional and mental health health care that I needed to, um, to be productive. But, you know, I was in and out of the hospital. And one day I said, you know, let me do my part. I decided then that I would not let kidney disease defeat me. So I became involved in my health care. I began to ask questions. I began to work with my health care team instead of just standing on the sideline of the team. And um, my nephrologist, he actually saw a change in me and 
him and the social worker at my former dialysis clinic had asked me, would I like to be a facility patient representative? And so with that position, I served as the liaison between the dialysis staff and uh, the patients. And I must say, I enjoyed that position so much. Um, it brought joy to me knowing that I was helping individuals, helping to educate them about living a better life on dialysis and managing kidney disease. So I had the opportunity to work with the social worker and a dietitian. And every month we would have a topic that we will focus on that was related to dialysis health. And it made a big difference throughout the population of our dialysis clinic. And from that, I got involved with the End Stage Renal Disease Network 14 of Texas Patient Advisory Council. And from, with that council, I get the opportunity to um, collaborate with my peers. We develop educational materials that are patient friendly. Um, we also uh, get the patient's perspective and we utilize it to create more educational resources that are both helpful for the patient and their family members. And from there, um, a lot of different organizations notice my drive, they notice my passion to help others and advocate for the kidney community. So I was invited to be a part of various kidney organizations, such as the National Kidney Foundation, the National Patient Family Engagement, Learning and Action Network, of course, the Kidney Project, um, American Society of Nephrology, uh, UNOS, known as the United Network of Organ Sharing, and that's just to name a few. Although I lead a very active and busy life, I have never lost my passion to help individuals like myself that have struggled trying to balance and manage kidney disease and having a better quality of life. So I'm driven every day to do my best. If I can just help one patient, one of my peers, get over a, a, a hump or overcome a barrier, I am empowered by that. So that keeps me going. You know, having that opportunity to educate my peers, mentor and advocate is, is fulfilling for me. So um, with that being said, I am so excited about this new development of the bio artificial kidney. And experiencing the ups and downs that I've experienced with my past kidney transplant and now my current kidney transplant, I, um, you know, it, it's time. And, and, and just to share a little bit more about myself, unfortunately, I am in the process of being reevaluated for a third kidney transplant. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that I get accepted uh, by uh, the transplant center that I am going through. And I, and, I, and I think to myself, what if the bio artificial kidney was on the market today? Will I be in this process of being reevaluated for a third kidney transplant? Will um, I be in jeopardy of rejecting a kidney transplant because I am highly sensitized? I truly don't know. But today, I'm hoping that, you know, we as patients can get our questions answered about this life-changing device. And with that being said, um, Dr. Fussell, do you have any questions for me? I think the first question that I would have for you is, can we possibly clone you so that we can have you in every single one of our units 
educating patients, encouraging patients, and modeling for patients how successful you can be when you decide that you are the one in control and not the doctor. Um, it is such an impressive story that you've had. It is so overwhelming the things that have happened to you. And then it's so overwhelming the things that you have chosen to do with the hand of cards that you were dealt in life. It is just so impressive. And you are exactly what I mean when I refer to my patients. And you're not my patient, but when I refer to my patients as my heroes, because whatever minor irritations I confront in my daily life, they are nothing compared to the existential challenges and crises that you've had to face again and again and again. So the kind of narrative that you have is exactly what I'm talking about when I say that my patients are my heroes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fasel, for your, your kind words and empowering words. Um, to answer your question, I don't think you can clone me just yet, but who knows? <laughs> Um, I appreciate um, your feedback. And I also appreciate you making the statement that your patients are your heroes. You know, most of the times you hear patients saying, my physician is my hero. He saved my life. Um, he knows how to work with me. He knows what I need. But I appreciate you making that statement that your patients are your heroes. And we need more physicians that think like you and that are more involved with their patients. So with that being said, maybe now we can um, get some of my questions for you answered. So Dr. Fassell, the first question I would like to start with. So the theme of today is patient preferences. First, can you explain what we mean when we say patient preferences? I can try. Um, so there's, um, I'd like to take a moment and, and just tell you a story from when I was a doctor in training, because I think it illustrates some of the problems that both the patient and the physician unconsciously come upon. When I was a resident, a doctor in training at the Cleveland VA hospital, we would round on the hospital and we would see the patients. There's one gentleman, the veteran, who um, never really said anything to us. He's like, yep, yeah, no, yep, yeah, no. And sir, did you get enough to eat? Yep. Yeah. Sir, are you having any pain? No. And I think the medical team slowly came to the tacit conclusion that the patient had some intellectual impairment. And for my own reasons at the time, um, I think probably because I love patients, I would often make a second set of rounds in the evening before I went home to try to figure out who my patients actually were. And so I sat down next to this man, who I think most of the other doctors thought was retarded. And um, you know, I said, I asked him, so what branch of the service are you in? He said, I was in the Air Force. I said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, you know, I washed airplanes, right? So this is not like this guy was a fighter pilot. This is, you know, he's kind of checking the boxes in our perceptions of him. And then I asked him a question that completely changed my life as a physician. And I try to ask this of every patient. I said, what do you do for fun? Mm -hmm. And he talked for about 25 minutes about how he builds um, these very large model airplanes, these gliders, and he flies them with a community of people and um, this gave me a window into him that he was 
capable of remarkable advanced executive planning. So he would think about what he wanted to do. He would find the plans and order them. And these weren't just kits. I mean, he was making these things from scratch. It wasn't just like, you know, a little bit of glue. And then he was a meteorologist because he can't just go fly these things any old day. He doesn't want a thunderstorm taking his airplane and throwing it in the dumpster. He had a social network of people that he did this with. And when you contrast that look into my patient that I obtained by asking him that one magic question, what do you do for fun? It showed what idiots we were as doctors to have made some assumption about this patient that he was intellectually challenged. We were the ones that were intellectually challenged. The reality was that he didn't have much use for us as doctors, and he was not going to waste his time talking to us when we would come blowing through in the morning saying, good morning, sir. How are you? What are you going on? Did you sleep last night? Are you hungry? He was like, never mind these chumps. And so I've come to view the way physicians and patients interact almost like, um, like billiards, that there are these very brief collisions that alter the trajectory of each party, but we don't spend very much time with each other, the physician and the patient. And so we have a very, as physicians, have a very narrow view, a very thin lens through which we view the patient. And the patient probably also has an equally thin view, an equally narrow lens, blinders like a horse, you know, of how they see the physician. And I think first and foremost, what we mean when we say patient preferences is to understand that the physician and the patient are approaching the problem of disease and illness, maybe from very different starting points. Uh, and it's easy for each side to kind of reach inaccurate conclusions about the other. When I talk to a patient about planning for dialysis, many patients clearly think that I'm trying to crowd them into starting dialysis as soon as possible. When the exact opposite is true, but maybe the physician, maybe I don't take enough time trying to discuss the difference between planning and doing. Um, we have such brief contacts with each other and each one of these contacts has such an immense impact on both parties, but especially on the patient, that we need to focus on patient preferences by understanding how the patient comes to the encounter with the healthcare system, how the patient feels their illness. I mean, there's a difference between disease and illness. The disease is, you know, what the pathologist sees under the microscope. The illness is what the patient experiences themselves. And we, it's easy for the doctor to go open up the computer screen, look at a bunch of numbers, say, you know, your hemoglobin is 10.8, sir, your creatinine is 4.6, and just rattle off a series of numbers. But the patient may be trying to calculate in their heads whether they're going to pay for the next dose of antihypertensive therapy or whether they're going to pay for their daughter's birthday party or whether they're going to be able to make rent. Mm -hmm. um, we all the time as physicians find patients labeled as non-compliant or non-adherent. And when you dig down even just a little bit, you find out, well, you know, Mr. Smith must not really care about himself because he misses his dialysis sessions. Well, it turns out that Mr. Smith is really feels it's important to not leave his nine-year-old daughter at home alone. Um, so patient preferences broadly is trying to understand that the physician is trained to think about lab values, is trained to think about disease, and the patient experiences illness. 
And so that matters in how we take care of patients, that matters in terms of what we prescribe. And most importantly for the kidney project, it matters in terms of what we designed into the device. The Food and Drug Administration began to think about this uh, several years ago, about, about a decade ago, because the Food and Drug Administration can wire in all kinds of safety requirements and require us to test something and test it again and test it a third time. And you know, that could get really burdensome for a patient and it can delay the implementation of a solution. And so I'm really glad that the FDA has acknowledged that patient preferences and how the patient's going to experience the treatment you know, has actually risen to be part of the formal evaluation process by which the government decides whether a device can be labeled for sale in the United States. I know that was kind of a long answer that kind of wandered around a little bit, but I, every day when I talk to patients, I'm reminded of how brief and how impactful and sometimes how misleading the interactions between physician and patient can be. And so patient preferences is relocating the mind of the engineer, of the doctor, of the FDA to say, hey, in this little billiards game where we're bumping into each other and impacting each other, can you please take the position of the patient rather than just the position of the physician? And we do that by formally acknowledging that the doctor doesn't know the patient's experience. And the doctor needs to ask, and the engineer needs to ask, like, hey, what's this like? What's this about? Um, if you have to take three different buses to get across town to your dialysis center, and then you have to try to get back, but maybe it's cold and it's at night and it's not a safe neighborhood, there's a lot of reasons why you might not show up for a particular dialysis session. Um, and from the physician's viewpoint, that's irresponsible. You need dialysis. But from the patient's standpoint, that's very responsible because you need to not get killed on the way home. So I think we need to reframe the device side of the world to acknowledge and put at the front of the discussion the fact that patients with kidney disease, and I may be speaking out of turn, Ms. McGowan, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the main preference that you would have is to not have kidney disease at all. And so if we start that as the starting point and work our way towards what compromises you can live with versus the doctor's point of view saying, oh, we need to get the creatinine down here. We need to get a KT overview of that, you know, hemoglobin injection. Maybe we can do something that will actually do some good for patients that's reflected in how you spend your time rather than reflected in a bunch of statistics reported to CMS. Thank you so much. Um... You clearly define patient preferences on various levels using various examples. So I want to ask you this, Dr. Fussell, how did you approach designing the bioartificial kidney with patient preferences in mind? So there's several different facets to that discussion. Um, we can talk in terms of survival and things that are driving mortality and morbidity. But when we think about what patients struggle with in the context of the treatments we have today, how many patients have to sit through a lecture about how much fluid they drink? How many patients did you ever have the experience that you're going to dialysis, somebody's grumbling at you about your interdialytic weight gain and how much you drank? That ever happened to you? Yes, when I first started dialysis, it did happen to me, but I wasn't 
truly educated about the amount of fluid that I was supposed to intake. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thirst is a very difficult thing to think your way out of. It's a very primal drive. So the physician can wag the finger all the physician wants, mm -hmm. but it's pretty hard to ignore thirst. So that would be one example of the technologies that are on offer today put the patient's cognitive decision-making in direct opposition to their brainstem instincts for what they need to do to survive, which is if I'm thirsty, I better drink some water. Mm -hmm. So again, so we had the idea that this needs to be something that can accommodate and maybe even require a lot of fluid intake because patients are incessantly thirsty who have diabetes and may have blips in their blood sugar and have biochemical reasons why they're thirsty. And just scolding them and saying, you can't drink all that water. That's just not effective. And it's putting the patient in a bind that they can't live with. Another thing is we worry deeply about the phenomenally restricted diets that we prescribe patients who depend on dialysis. So uh, sometimes I think that if a patient's gonna follow a diabetic renal dialysis diet, they're gonna be stuck eating celery and cardboard. There's yeah. just the things that we phrase as being good for you, you know, green vegetables, fresh fruits, you know, protein, well, that's all got phosphorus and potassium in it. So we needed to have a device that could overcome the diet limitations of dialysis. Because I just look at, you know, we get told, think about, you know, heart healthy food, eat a good diet. And then we turn around to patients and say, yeah, but you can't have this and you can't have this and you can't have this. So there are, those were a couple of guiding principles. Another thing, access. Patients, you know, view the access in their arm as disfiguring. It re frequently requires trips back to have it revived. And then it's kind of like a fundamental violation of biology that you're gonna have, you're gonna break the skin, you know, 312 times a year. You're gonna have two needles put in your arm 156 times a year. And that's 312 opportunities for infection. So we wanted something that's gonna be under the skin that was never gonna break the surface of the skin, period. So that was another criteria that we checked off. You think about patients who, have per who are on peritoneal dialysis or patients who are compelled to use a catheter for hemodialysis, we don't, you can't swim. You can't take a bath. You can't submerge that, right? There's all these things like, oh, you can't do this. Oh, you can't do that. Having as a axiom starting off that we're not gonna have something breaking the skin. That was key. Um, other ways that patient preferences centered into this thing. Um, we talked about diet, spontaneity, that we wanted to be able to, patients to be able to eat what they eat what they want rather than celery and cardboard. Another thing that emerged that would never have occurred to the physician, I think, um, the patients want the freedom to move around. They want the freedom to travel. Right now, if you're in a situation where you depend on hemodialysis, going to the hemodialysis clinic, how easy is it for you to just pick up and go on a trip? Can you just go to the beach, spend a week away, or do you have to negotiate with your social worker, find a dialysis clinic that will accept travelers, then you get there and you don't necessarily know how much you trust these people that you've never met before, blah, blah, blah. So, we wanted patients to be able to do the things that add pleasure and gratification and fun to their lives rather than erecting these barriers to doing that. So we, you know, it's easy to have sympathy to say, oh my gosh, you know, 
I would feel off. I'd be really unhappy if that happened to me. Um, that's how I define sympathy. Empathy is actually feeling distress at the distress of somebody else. And when I was first a paramedic years ago, that was the hardest thing for me was to recognize that when my patient was in danger, it wasn't me that was in danger as well. And so I've never lost that. I've never stopped seeing an increase in the creatinine as a failure of me, even if it's my patient's creatinine. And so it's distressing to me to have to present patients with choices that they do not like. Um, and so having empathy for people, actually ha being upset when they're upset is I think crucial. Absolutely, I agree. And um, we have so many questions. I want to get to the questions from the um, attendees. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to ask you this question. Now, I have bragged about this device um, in so many of my uh, kidney organizations. One question that has come about is once the bio artificial kidney is placed in a person, what is the device's life expectancy? Uh, so... Um, I think Yogi Bear said that predictions are hard, especially about the future. Um, our goal is that we have a device that we sew into a patient like it was a transplanted kidney and that it lasts for years, two years, five years. And that number is not just plucked out of the sky. We actually had patient preference survey and you participated in this where we ask patients right now, if you depend on hemodialysis, you're coming to a clinic 156 times a year. Would you be willing to come back for a procedure to replace a device every 10 years, every five years, every two years, every six months? And that raised you know, exactly the reason why we did this survey, we conducted this survey was that, uh, Patients actually expressed a lot of concern about wound healing. And so as soon as you have the, the mental leap, well, of course, half of our patients who depend on dialysis or patients who have diabetes, have vascular problems and have impaired wound healing. That's what led us to choose this time point as a, as a trade-off that would be acceptable to patients who have very real concerns about wound healing and so on. We would like to be able to manage our device in a way that it's not a burden on the patient. So that when we think about designing a device, we want to think about the things that are difficult to do, like vascular access. When we're thinking about sewing to a blood vessel, that's the kind of stuff that you really get to do once, and that's got to be permanent. And then there's the parts, the components that might wear out, cells might die, cells might be limited in their ability to self-repair like healthy cells do in a healthy body. Um, mm -hmm. And so we want those things to be easy to replace as the outpatient procedure um, with the goal being that we have a device that's permanent, that we have one surgery and then maybe there's minor touch-ups. Maybe there's minor replacement. Every patient's different. You look around the dialysis clinic where you are, and there's some patients, they have one fistula that was placed once and they're good to go. And there's other patients who've had it one fistula, then another fistula, then a graft, then a second graft, and they're still having to dialyze through a catheter. So every patient is different, and I can't pretend that we're going to have one size fits all. But our goal is a permanent device. Sounds good. Well, thank you for answering the questions that I personally have for you, Dr. Fassell. Now, um, 
let's go on to some questions um, submitted by the audience members. So one question I have here is which aspect of the technical development um, are you currently focused on and how close are you to completing it? So we have, as I think most people who've participated in these sessions before know, there's multiple technologies that are involved in building an implantable artificial kidney that doesn't require dialysate, that doesn't require sorbent cartridges, that doesn't require batteries, that doesn't require wires and pumps and drive lines, and all of the baggage that accompanies dialysis. So we've had to come up with a way of channeling blood from the human body into a set of filters without requiring any anticoagulation, without requiring warfarin or heparin, without requiring any pumps. And we've succeeded with that. Check, mm -hmm. done. We were told that we could do that. We were told countless times you'll never succeed. Well, we succeeded. We succeeded by heavy lifting, primarily done by Dr. Roy at UCSF, um, and using technologies adapted from the artificial heart industry. And so we've gotten there. Dr. Roy, again, the technical genius of the project has made such huge advances with these silicon-based membranes that we're now able to have a large-scale device that we implant in experimental animals that functions for as long as we plan the experiment for. Um, so that's something that requires funding to get over the FDA regulatory hurdles rather than there being any residual technical unknowns that we don't know how to address. Then there's the cell biology part of the equation where I've spent most of my time for the last few years. And we've made huge advances there um, where we were told by the experts that cells grown in an artificial environment just don't work. They die right away, they don't function, they don't transport, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we applied ourselves to this challenge. And I've always joked with you and with Dr. Roy and with Liz that ignorance is my secret superpower, that I didn't know that I couldn't, so I just went ahead and did. Um, and by taking a, by not having had traditional biology training, having physics and electrical engineering training, I think I was able to ask some of the so-called stupid questions that actually led us to success. So we're optimizing the cell therapy part of things. And I think that's actually only a very few years away from completion, maybe not even a few years. I know that we have already shown the fundamental proof of concept that we can have a filter and cells working together to filter the blood and then concentrate the filtrate. And so the technical development, the unknown have really been knocked back. The filter is just ready to go and the cells are almost ready to go. Sounds good, sounds promising. Um, so with, with that question that you just answered about you guys, over, overcoming those barriers that you were told, no, that's not possible. There's no way you can do that. So I wanna ask you, will the device be able to accommodate damaged arteries? Well, I think the simplistic answer is it better be able to accommodate damaged arteries because I have yet to meet a patient since stage kidney disease who has healthy arteries. Um, Again, we know that even infants who are born, for example, with polycystic kidney disease and depend on dialysis from a very early age, they develop vascular disease very quickly. So I don't know if there's a single patient who depends on dialysis who has 
healthy <laughs> arteries. So we better be able to accommodate damaged arteries or we're not gonna be able to do any good for anybody. Now, I don't know from, from how you phrase that, whether you mean arteries that have been narrowed by atherosclerotic plaque, whether you mean arteries that have been traumatized, arteries that have been already used for a vascular access. But the reality is, if we cannot accommodate damage, then we're not gonna help patients. I don't have patients in perfect health coming into my clinic. I don't have patients in perfect health coming into the transplant clinic. You know, one of the, as, as an aside, as you know, Precious, from your advocacy work, clinical trials of all kinds of different things, artificial heart devices, drugs, this, that, are constantly excluding patients who have kidney disease because they have accumulated so much trauma of one kind or another that drug companies and device companies are afraid to include them in clinical trials. So as far as we're concerned, these are my people. This is not a device that I'm engineering to take care of fresh, perfect, young, you know, undamaged patients. This is a, we're engineering a device to accommodate patients who have congestive heart failure, diabetes, vascular disease. We are thinking about the patients who could not ever qualify for a kidney transplant because of all the other illnesses that they have. You know, kidney transplants, you know yourself and most of our audience knows how challenging it is to even be listed for a kidney transplant, let alone get a kidney transplant. Did you pass your cardiac stress test? Are we sure that you're psychiatrically capable of taking care of an organ? Are we sure about this? Are we sure about that? Are we absolutely sure that you're not harboring a cancer somewhere? Well, you know what? What about everybody else? I'm focusing on them. So yes, we will be able to accommodate damaged arteries because if we can't, what the heck are we doing? Hmm. Sounds good. I mean, it, it brought me hope right away because I've been told that this third time around, you know, if I'm um, able to receive this third kidney transplant, maybe my last opportunity to receive a kidney transplant. So that sounds very promising and hopeful for individuals that are like myself. And for the sake of time, Dr. Fassell, I have um, one last question from the audience, and that is, have you begun to set parameters for patient trials? For example, have you set parameters around age, dialysis type, um, vascular issues, et cetera? So I'm going to be a wise guy for a moment. I know that'll shock you and, and everybody else, but really our... Uh... Our, our inclusion criteria for the clinical trial is that you're alive. <laughs> um, so, I mean, in all honesty, you can't be designing these trials for patients who are perfect um, because ain't none of us perfect. So we've talked to the FDA about who would be the best candidates for the first use of an implantable artificial kidney. And this, this may migrate over time. So um, as you acknowledge that you're highly sensitized, so you've got a steep hill to climb to locate an organ. But on the other hand, you're all prepared for a trip to the operating room. So in terms of stress tests and minimizing your operative risk. So we might in the past have been looking at patients who had a very high PRA, but were already listed for a transplant because we don't want to do harm, right? We don't want to be so eager to test things that we end up causing harm in the process. So we want to at least start with patients where we think we know something about their ability to survive a surgery and the risk of a major surgery. Um, but our goal is that we expand this rapidly. Our timeline to clinical trials is pretty quick because we have moved beyond the discovery science unknowns issue, that we have a 
technical development timeline of a couple of years given money to support the project. But we do not have to grapple with the scientific unknown of xenotransplant, of organoids, of trying to repopulate a ghost organ with donor cells. I mean, I would love it. I'd be whooping for joy if I could go out to the farm, meet some cute little pig and get a kidney from that little pig and put it in my patient and my patient would be perfectly healthy. I would, there's nothing that Dr. Roy and I would like more than to be put out of business by somebody coming up with a cure for renal failure, by somebody coming up with, um, you know, a pig kidney or a cow kidney or something like that. But I think we've learned over the years that some things are further away than we'd hoped for. And since we have, over the last 15 years, overcome the unknown, we now have a technical development timeline that's on the order of three or four years of appropriate funding. Not, I think, the discovery science timeline where um, everybody wants to be a rainmaker, but nobody wants to pour a glass of water. Um, the promise of that we're going to eradicate kidney disease someday may not have the same inspiring uh, impact for a patient who's already suffering from kidney disease or is ending up depending on dialysis. I agree. The best dialysis is the dialysis you never have to prescribe because the mouse doctors at the NIH have found out how come kidneys fail and have overcome that. That would be wonderful. But in the real world, we have 110,000 new patients a year coming to us with failed kidneys, and I want to focus on them. And I want to do this in the lifetime of somebody who's starting dialysis today not some 15, 20 year, 40 year project, because my patients aren't gonna be alive 40 years from now based on the best care we have available. Hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Fasel, for your, your input and in answering those questions. Um, now I'm gonna pass it back over to you, Liz. Great, thank you both so much. This has been a, a really wonderful conversation. Um, and I, for once, I actually have been able to keep uh, track and keep current with the questions in the chat. So I think we can go back to some more of the questions that were submitted um, on the registration. And so the first of those will go to Dr. Fazell, um, and that is about the cells. Um, so the, the question is how long will the cells in the membrane survive? Uh, can the cells regenerate within the membrane? So we have uh, wrestled with the assertion from experts in the field that kidney cells don't survive in the dish. Um, our most recent experiment that is in review for publication now, the cells went out 47 weeks, no problems, fully functional. And the only reason why it's not 48 weeks or 52 weeks or 100 weeks is that we purposely killed them by stressing them to see you know, how much can we hurt these guys and have them keep going. Um, so we have, with the ways that we're culturing these cells, we've yet to see a limit on the lifetime of the cells in cell culture. Um, we think that we know from our experience with human kidneys that after an injury in some patients, maybe even most patients, the kind of cells that we use in the artificial kidney are able to repair the injured organ. That's why patients who have an episode of acute kidney injury don't all, every single one of them end up depending on dialysis. And we would like to be able to document the way that the cells are able to regenerate and repair themselves on the membranes as we grow them. Um, the, there are some narrow technical challenges there, but the way we grow these cells in the first place 
is fundamentally regeneration process. And the thing to try to understand is the cues that are telling the cells, hey, we need to divide and, and repair things and cover up this, you know, fix this defect where another cell died versus the cues that are telling the cells like, hey, everything's cool. We're done dividing, it's time to get to work. Um, those cues that switch the cells between repairing and working is exactly the same questions that we've been trying to understand and master and have developed control over within the laboratory. Great to know, thank you for that answer. Um, the next question is for Precious um, and it is, how do you manage to keep such a positive attitude all the time? I've known you for three years and you always have a smile and a great time with your life. Well, thank you for whoever sent that question in. Um, I can't admit, I do have my, my challenges. I do have my struggles. Um, as I stated earlier, I decided a long time ago that I would not let kidney disease defeat me. However, that goes for other obstacles in my life as well. So basically what I do is, is every day I have to empower myself. If I don't empower myself, I begin to think about the challenges that I'm going through, the what if, what if I have to return to um, dialysis before I receive a third kidney transplant? What if neither transplant center accepts me? What would my life look like? So every day I empower myself. And like I stated as well too, I'm empowered and encouraged by helping um, my peers overcome barriers to um, living with kidney disease. I'm empowered by um, mentoring them, helping them through a situation, educating them. So that, that's food for me. So that's why I'm able to, you know, just smile, smile at in life and smile at what's going on. And also smiling too helps you to stay looking young. So I'm gonna <laughs> smile all the time. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, next one is for Dr. Fazell. Uh, why do you think the two largest kidney care companies um, haven't invested in new and up and coming technologies like this? Uh, you know, I, I can't put myself in their shoes. Um, I think it's very easy to uh, throw some shade at companies. Um, the largest companies in the U.S., full stop, are publicly traded companies that have uh, historically placed fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders front and central. And so they may not want to allocate resources towards a project that they are not sure of the timeline on. Um, I think we're more sure of the timeline than other people are. Um, but I wouldn't pretend to, to speak for them. Um, you know, they clearly are aware of us. They clearly talk to us. They clearly are asking us questions. Um, but I don't, you know, you look at the size of the industry, 60 plus billion dollars, and you look at the funding that we need to get to patients, you know, it's less than, you know, a thousandth of that money once compared to $60 billion a year. Um, it's, you know, I, I couldn't pretend to speak to them. You know, obviously my view of what's important for patients and what's important for the future, uh, they don't share because otherwise they would have given us the money already. Um, so I don't know, I, it would be pure speculation on my point. You should go ask them. <laughs> um, that would be my advice. If you're curious, ask them because I can't answer for them because I'm not them. Um, I would probably resist 
the urge to assign bad faith to anybody, to be honest with you. Um, I think people have different priorities for, for what they do and how they spend their time and how they allocate their resources. I would like to think about allocating resources to patients. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily make them out to be some devious enemy that's undermining us. I think they just have their own horizons for when they're ready to invest. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and we're, we just hit the hour, so I'll just um, end with one last question, and that is, what can patients uh, and or their loved ones do? Um, is there anything they can do to help um, make the project go faster? Um, so the biggest impact in technology development in healthcare have really come from patients leaning on the government to invest. And so this could be the work that was done years ago, 40 years ago, to invest in the technologies that today are LVADs and artificial hearts. This could be the, the pressure that was brought to bear uh, about 15 years ago uh, to fund the development of continuous glucose monitoring and insulin pumps for patients with type one diabetes. The reality is that right now, what we do has graduated from the discovery science that is what the NIH wants to invest in. The NIH wants to develop knowledge. They don't want to fund manufacturing objects. And yet, pertinent to your question about the large dialysis organization, the investment that's needed to get us over the, over the hump to, into patients isn't you know space rocket science levels of money, but still it may be a little bit of an uncertain timeline for the risk capital community to say, well, I can invest in Uber or Lyft, or I can invest in Bill and Chuvo, um, and I know I'm going to get the money out of Uber and Lyft in a couple of years. And Bill and Chuvo, this might take a minute. Um, there's an opportunity for the government to step in and say, look at we, the federal government, are spending close to $100 billion a year on end-stage renal disease. And we have not seen any changes in end-stage renal disease in 40 plus years. Um, why don't we take a little teeny thin sliver of that $100 billion a year and direct it to Shuvo and Bill, to the Kidney Project, to move this forward? Um, that's what happened with the artificial heart program. That's what happened with continuous glucose monitoring. It's going to be patients and their loved ones and their families bringing pressure to bear on the government to say, look at nobody else is stepping up. Guys, you need to step up because we can do better. Great. Thank you so much. I think those are great uh, words to end on. Um, so Precious and Dr. Fazell, thank you for joining us today um, and, and everyone for tuning in. Um, this video will be on our YouTube page, so you can come back to it later, uh, share it with anyone you think might be interested, and we will be back with you again next month. So um, thanks again for joining today. Thank well, you. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Yes. Yeah. I, I also meant them. I think I missed them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. All right. <laughs> all right. Take care, y'all. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.